So uh, welcome everybody from my side as well. I'm uh, Christian. I'm a partner here in Berlin at eVentures. And I will be your host tonight again. Um, welcome to the sixth se uh, session of From Scratch. Today we have a very exciting topic. One of the probably most important topics if you are starting a company in the internet, and that is obviously to actually acquire your first users and build an efficient marketing engine. It is about understanding the key KPIs that you need in order to track if your performance is going towards the right direction or the wrong direction. So we will be speaking about customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime values. And we will see what the best practices are in order to actually track the developments in this field. Um, we will speak about identifying the right marketing channels and finding the ideal marketing mix. And we will definitely try to give you some of the insights that you have not heard of before. And there is probably not a better person in Berlin, in Europe, and maybe in the world. I have the pleasure to having Florian Heinemann here today with me. Um, Florian is, uh, as I said, one of the leading experts in online marketing. He is a founding partner of Berlin-based Project A Ventures, a befriended VC firm of ours that we love working with. Florian is also known for his um, time at Rocket Internet, where he was an early employee and managing director of, uh, of Rocket. He has been instrumental to some of the leading companies from the European and German ecosystem. Uh, he has been a driving force at Zalando and, uh, for example, eDarling, and has been an investor not only with Project A, but also privately in more than 100 companies, including uh, companies like uh, Trivago, Lilidu, and Audi Bene. And the fun fact before I get Florian on stage is that we almost lost this guy to academia. He was about to become a professor, but then Oli Zamba actually called him up and said, hey, don't do this shit. You should come and join me and start companies. And with this, Florian, please come up on stage. So first of all, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. And we will, of course, tap into some of your experiences throughout the session. So what, what I want to do is let, let's start a company with each other, OK? So this is what you are good at. And uh, I would like to actually have you in the marketing position and make sure that we make the right decisions on marketing. So one of the first and probably most important things that we should do from, from my experience is we should hire someone who is going to do marketing for us. Who is this person going to be? Is it the CMO? Is it the VP marketing? Is it a junior marketing manager? Will he do performance marketing? What is the person that we are looking for? I think it's, it's essential to have somebody in the, in the marketing function that's kind of an architect for the marketing function. I think a lot of people talk about architect, like being an architect in IT. I think being an architect in, in marketing is just as, as essential. So somebody that's able to design a marketing program and the corresponding systems. Um, and whether you call that person CMO, VP marketing, or whatever, I'm not so happy with call, uh, hiring a growth uh, person. Yeah, uh, I, and I will tell you why. I think the um, if you hire an excellent growth person, I think that that's a good idea. The big danger with growth person, we are talking about growth hackers, right? Uh, growth hacking type person yeah. um, uh, that can be great if the if the um, growth hacker is an excellent person. I think the problem is if that person is not excellent. Um, people get lost. Yeah? So the problem about being a growth hacking type person is you have to be very broad and very deep at the same time. And that is something that is very, very few people. Uh, I always compare that to the John McEnroe of, of marketing. Yeah? If you, uh, the older ones among you might remember John McEnroe. Uh, he probably uh, practiced five hours a week and was still number one in world tennis because he was just a very, very gifted person. Uh, but most of us are not that gifted, uh, neither in tennis nor in marketing. So I think if you have the right growth hacking type person that's able to go broad and deep, that's great. But that's very few people that can do that. Um, and so if you don't find that person, I think it's, it's, it's better if you hire a traditional, more craftsmanship-like um, marketing person that will just do a solid job. That is something that's critical. I think what has emerged over the last two, three years, or a little more, is to find a person that's able to also uh, support the kind of storytelling um, video kind of DNA. Yeah? Because I don't know what your experience is. My experience is you either have a branding type DNA in a marketing department or you have a quantitative kind of DNA in a marketing department. It's very difficult to find a person that supports both kind of DNAs. What would you go for first? Because what I see in many of the companies today is that they have both capabilities, but yeah. we would have to decide for one. Uh, I think it's, it's probably easier to, to uh, start quant 
and turn a little more qual over time than vice versa. Because I think the, the big difficulty when you start qualitative from the start, and, and brand, it's just, it's a little like this growth hacking kind of experience. If you have an excellent marketing person um, driving the branding piece, that's very analytical and systematic, it can still work. The big danger about branding driven people is you will not find out whether they're excellent or not. Yeah? So easy because the characteristics of performance are just so diffuse. So, so now let's assume we have hired this rock star that you have just described, So, because I'm sure you would. Absolutely. So how actually would we go about our first customers? How would you go about it? I would start with channels where I expect a high conversion. Yeah? So in many cases, That's SEA. Do you start with the channels or would you start with having a persona in mind where you think, okay, the guy or the yeah. girl that is going to buy is this and that age, comes from a yeah. city or suburban area? I think by now I probably would, yeah? but, but not on a very deep level. I think a few years ago we wouldn't. Yeah? We would just do SEA and just see how it works. Definitely something that I would think about a little different today. So I would start with at least a rough persona today. To, to inform the messaging, but I would still start with channels where I would expect a high conversion, which is often SEA, which could also be obviously retargeting and these kind of things, and test out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then probably also do some Facebook, uh, uh, also for market research purpose, or Facebook, Instagram, you know, like the whole Facebook family, to, to inform um, what kind of target group do, does actually work. Yeah? Because I think if you, if you start, you have a certain persona in mind, you have a certain target group in mind, And then you try out uh, things, uh, uh, and then you see on Facebook or, or on Instagram what actually does work, yeah? and that might be quite different um, from from the people that you actually originally thought. Yeah, so that's why I wouldn't put too much work into you know a creative agency coming up with some kind of persona because I think I would just do that work if you basically see okay, does my product and service actually make sense, and do I really know what the target group is? And and I think for that, uh, Facebook is a great tool. And is, is there some kind of a perfect budget to start with? Like Eric Ries back in the days in his famous book said that you should do some smoke tests. Like this could be a couple of hundred bucks. So is, is there a perfect number to know if a channel works or not? I always go backwards. So I basically, uh, I start with the number of conversions, whatever that is, leads, sales, yeah. customers, whatever. And where I'm feeling comfortable, yeah, I mean, you could also calculate it with some kind of representativeness statistics, but also if you just do it by, you know, uh, just rule of thumb, uh, I think I would always go backwards and say, okay, how many leads do I, th do I need to feel comfortable? And then calculate backward what's the conversion rate for that lead or customer or order. And then uh, the, what's the cost per click? And it doesn't really matter whether it's cost per click or CPM or CPO. I mean, you can always calculate kind of what will be the budget and then um, basically calculate backwards from what do I need uh, in order to have a representative sample. Um, and then calculate the, back, uh, the, the budget I need to, to get that back, backwards, basically. Okay. What people still do is they, they start with a too broad marketing mix too early. Um, I think there's very few businesses where that's necessary. You know, if you are like in a Groupon-ish type situation uh, where it's really, or delivery hero type situation where it's really, you need to be the market leader really quickly because um, it's such a winner, takes it all dynamic in the business model, then it might make sense, but otherwise it doesn't really matter whether you're two months earlier or later, that's at least my experience. So I'd rather do it in a solid way and move forward in a gradual kind of way. Because what, what the experience is, if you move on too many channels too quickly, you don't do the channels right, and you don't do the testing right to really understand what works, what doesn't work. So I prefer staying narrow and then going broader, 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 um, and don't start with branding too early, but only if I feel that You know, if you don't convert an SEO, if your retargeting conversion is shitty, there's no need to, de to do television, do like some larger YouTube campaign. Yeah. Um, uh, because the likelihood that that will work is rather low. Yeah? I mean, you, you can be lucky, but uh, in most cases, you're not lucky. It depends a little bit on the market yeah. dynamics, I agree. So let's now assume we have hired the right person and uh, we have defined our customer segments and have identified some of the channels. What role does the product actually pay? So I have this nice quote here which says that marketing is the tax you pay for not having a product that people love. Yeah, I, I, I think if you're in a, in a Skype type product, yeah, then that might be true because I think, but if, you do, if you're check 24 <laughs> or you have a dating service, 
Yeah, nobody has waited for you. It's like very hard to emotionalize the product. Oh, great! This. Uh, uh, by, by the way, on Skype, I just read this tweet today, which was like Skype was founded 15 years ago, and the first thing you still say is, "Can you hear me?" Yeah. So yeah. people <laughs> don't hear it. Yeah. No. As I said earlier, you cannot um, compensate a shitty product with good marketing. So I think that that is definitely true. And I think a mistake that we did at Rocket quite early, being pressured by a person you know who, was. <laughs> to put marketing on premature products. And, and also that can be a good strategy, yeah, if you have the financial capability uh, uh, to, to fund it, yeah, because sure. it puts a lot of pressure on the organization if everybody knows that you throw like a couple of 10,000 euros out of the roof every day. Yeah, so that can also that can be an efficient strategy if you're able to fund it. But I think if you're using a sane kind of marketing approach, I would basically say, you know, you wait for a good NPS, you wait for good repeat purchase behavior, you look at your cohorts, if they behave well, then you start scaling, not before. But I think even if you have a great product, even if you have a great product, I think it also helps to fuel the growth by a functioning marketing mix. Yeah? So even if you have virality in the product and the product sells itself, yeah. you can grow faster. And if you're in a venture business, growth is the main value driver. Yeah? So you would lose out on potential value, number one. And I've been also invested in some uh, businesses that went viral for two, three years. And then after two, three years, virality stopped. Yeah? So and what do you do then? Yeah? Mm. Then you're screwed because- You, you have, have no alternative. You have, you have no alternative. You have no understanding of what, what you can do. Yeah? So I can encourage everybody, as long as you have virality, that's great, but don't rely on it. I think your business is a lot more resilient if you have a diversified marketing mix. It's not, uh, it's not only basically, an, it's also if you have one or two channels working in your marketing mix, I also encourage everybody to diversify the marketing mix, even if it's a little more expensive, also to make the whole thing more resilient, yeah? Because you never know what happens. Competitor might enter the market, virality stops, so it's two things I would always do, really trying to understand what are the dynamics driving your business, so building up a very good analytics, so that you can actually act when virality stops, for whatever reason, so that you actually know what the problem is. And I think what is something that's uh, key for me We've been focusing very strongly on understanding these kind of things. So understanding what is the monetization, but taking the monetization as a given. I think what will be the key differentiator is not taking that as a given, but actually understanding how to influence it. If you look at the early days of Rocket, why there were some successes, uh, yes, there were also some good products, but I think we were able to differentiate ourselves due to a superior marketing approach. Today that will probably look different, yeah. But I think if you, if you still, you, it's still possible to differentiate yourself. I think a good product will have to follow, and, and only with a very superior product and experience, you'll be able to build a sustainable business. And I think you, the only way that you can really achieve this by having specialized people doing it across the whole company, because you know whether you, what, what do you do with VAT? What do you do with vouchers? What do you do with discounts? What you, so there's so many uh, things that you can put into the lifetime value, out of the lifetime value. There's good reasons for all these kind of decisions, but I think you need specialized people that are basically uh, doing this. I, I want to go a little bit more in detail here. So is there a framework, though, that you can recommend to actually figure this out? So w where do you start? Do you start with... 20% uh, budget on Facebook and Google, um, the 10% budget a little bit on Instagram, then you go a little bit for display, RTB, whatever. Mm -hmm. So is there a framework that you apply to, to get it started and get the first set of data in to make the next decision? It's basically, I would start with the search world because that's the lower funnel list, apart from retargeting as you can probably get, and then move to Facebook, Instagram, GDN can still be good. How relevant you, is Instagram today? I very, very relevant, it, it, yeah. I mean, for some businesses, it's more relevant than, than Facebook yeah. already, yeah? So it really depends on the business. Um, Outbrain Tabula can be surprisingly irrelevant. I mean, if you look at companies like Bubble or if you at companies like Outfittery, so especially things that people are not searching for, yeah, where the search volume is not so high. And then, if you master that, I would try to move into uh, some kind of video-based advertising, yeah? um, um, whether it's on YouTube or, and also Facebook is great. I mean, in, in some destinations, Facebook video is still really good because it's not so used um, as, for example, on YouTube. And um, my experience, at least, is I don't know what, what your experience is, but that is, I guess, very diverse, that it's easier to get a performance campaign going by now on Facebook uh, in a video type format than it is on YouTube. Because you mentioned some of these brands like Tabula and Outbrain, you're in the industry for almost 20 years now. 
marketing has changed significantly over time and there's so many new kind of things to do in marketing. What was the easier time, like starting out or is it today? What was more fun? I think getting started is a e lot easier today. If you just think about Google, and that's like the true revolution of Google AdWords. I mean, just think like 30 years ago, you know, you had a monopoly of media agencies accessing um, inventory. And they, with a mediocre job yeah, that they're still doing today, they could, they could earn shitloads of, of money. And, and I think today, you know, you with a credit card can bid, and five euros on that credit card, you, you can bid by the same rules as uh, Henkel can, or Zalando can, or Booking can, and that's great. I mean, you have millions of advertisers, so getting started is great. And I think if you see how many small and medium businesses are rising on Google and are rising on Facebook, it's awesome. I think what has become significantly more difficult is bringing it to relevant scale. So I think becoming self-employed in the sense of having your own business is easier than ever in a digital way, but becoming relevant and big has become a lot more difficult. You need customer retention just as much as customer acquisition. Why? Uh, because of what we just said about the platforms and them killing niches and them killing uh, good mechanisms to generate profitable customers. That is all systematically going away just by the auction mechanism that they have designed. Yeah? So, um, and so the, the, the sustainability of a, last, of, a, of a marketing mix is today a lot shorter or a lot less uh, sh certain than it used to be. No, I agree. And like, of course, getting to your own platform is a long, long way. And there's this joke in the VC community that we could directly wire the money to Facebook and Google because that's basically where our money is being spent, right? <laughs> so we have uh, come to an end for this session. But most importantly, Florian, thank you so much for being our guest tonight. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. I think we have never had a guest so far who actually engaged the audience in a way that everybody felt like there's a good amount of laughing involved as well. It was really a pleasure. I have learned a lot. So um, Thank you for, for um, unlocking a little bit of the secrets over the last uh, 20 years that you have already almost gathered as an uh, experience yeah, quite in, the, frightening. In, the, yeah. in the online world. Close and, to retirement, um, I guess. Yeah. We, are, we are very much looking forward to be continuing to work with you. Um, it's, uh, it's great that we have people like you in Berlin and in Europe. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for being here.